Good morning. Welcome to North Bethesda United Methodist Church. Um, welcome to those who are in our midst here and also to those who might be tuning in via, via Zoom. We're delighted to have you joining in our service. And today we celebrate Mother's Day. And what I'd like to do is share a message from our pastor, Karis Groggins, who is re returning tomorrow, in fact, from a well-deserved sabbatical leave. Her message was, especially on this day, in which many in our country mark Mother's Day, we remember that in this church, all of who you are is welcome. We welcome you who have wonderful relationships with your mothers and you who may have strained or complicated relationships. We welcome you who have planned this day to a T and you who may have forgotten to get a card. We welcome you who are mothers and you who wish to be and you who don't wish to be. We welcome you who have lost mothers and you who have lost children. This is a space where God invites us to lay aside what the world says we should be or feel or do on this day. And instead, we are all embraced by a God who formed and forms us, who calls us by name day in and day out and wants to have a relationship with us in the name of that God, we welcome you all. As with last Sunday, the theme of the service is welcoming the stranger, whether a newly arrived immigrant or refugee. And the order of worship was dra drafted by Reverend Kara with a focus on what God expects, us, expects of us as Christians. And with this in mind, she invited a, a guest speaker this morning, Eli Johnson, whom I'll introduce at the start of the, of, of the message. So now I'd welcome our liturgist, Monica Dean, to, to deal with the opening. Good morning, church family. Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. You will be reading the part in bold. Come with your questions, come with your awe. Come with your energy, come with your weariness. Come with your sadness, come with your joy. Please join us in the opening hymn in the United Methodist Hymnal number 120, Your Love, O God.
Good morning. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. And welcome to this beautiful Mother's Day service and the beautiful day that we have today. A very sunny, bright day. And as part of the service, this is the part when we request that you share any joys or concerns. So any prayers or joy of concern. Please keep my sister-in-law's dad, Reverend Ron Irvin, in prayer. He was, um, he's due to have an operation on Wednesday. It had to be postponed from this past week, um, and he's in great pain. And we're hoping the operation helps relieve that pain. Thank you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all the mothers who are suffering today, ones that had miscarriages and ones that had to give their children away. Please remember them today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'd like to say a prayer for my family's church in Las Vegas. Um, they just celebrated their fifth year anniversary and they are continuing to spread, spread the love of Jesus in the Las Vegas uh, and Henderson community in uh, Nevada. And I'd also like to share a prayer of joy for my two daughters who just completed their sophomore and junior exams in the university. So uh, they got through. So we're gonna say a prayer for that. Thank you so much. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'm so grateful this morning. I thank God my last born child, Charlene, is graduating with a PhD in pharmacy at Baltimore. <laughs> and my first born daughter, Stembile, she's here for the graduation from South Africa. Thank God for Jenny Messis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Good morning. My name is Sue, and I wanted to say thank you to Bob Dean and his team of merry men who have brought some wonderful treats for coffee hour this morning. We hope you'll join us after service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Just want to remind us to continue praying for John Griffin. They are now in South Carolina. John is having a real struggle to come back to good health. And Mary Lou just asked that we would continue to pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anyone else? Thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to come to you this morning. We bring you our joys and our burdens, and we know that you are a God who knows even those things that are deep within our hearts and our souls that we may not even able to express verbally, but you know each one of us, and we ask you to supply each and every one of our needs. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And at this, at this time, <clears throat> I would like to read a, an article that Reverend Kera had chosen for us for this occasion. And it was written by Pastor Magre de Vega, Senior Pastor of High Park Methodist Church in Tampa in the year 2013. And it goes, God of provision and unconditional love. On this day, when we acknowledge the importance of motherhood among us, we first give thanks that you are a loving parent to all of us. From your being, all life was born, and in your bosom, all creation is nurtured. We have, you have formed us in your image as your children and gathered us together as a brood under your wing. We have united, you have united us, kindred members of one human family, and we are grateful to you, your offspring together, to be your offspring together. We celebrate your divine love reflected in human expressions of motherhood. We give you thanks for the mothers among us 
and ask you to strengthen them in their daily tasks. Grant them wisdom in the lessons they teach, patience in the discipline they foster, and persistence in the promotion of decency and compassion, both by word and example. May they be given the honor and thanks they deserve, but often do not receive. We thank you for all motherly figures, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, wives, stepmothers, foster mothers, guardians, babysitters, teachers, healthcare providers, neighbors, friends, loved ones, and many others who practice self-sacrifice and embody compassion to all who are privileged to be in their influence. Grant them vigor to carry on their work and the satisfaction that the holy privilege of their task affords. We acknowledge you, O oh God, that even amid our grateful celebration, many of us come with restless spirits, reluctant to name the difficulties of this day. For some, this day brings the sort of awareness of their own inability to conceive biological children. Draw your tender spirit near their feelings of self-betrayal, impotence, or grief, and remind them that those who struggle with infertility have always shared a special place in your heart. We pray for those who have struggled, who have suffered miscarriages, those fatigued by fertility treatments, and those struggling through the process of adoption. May they remember that in your power and through your church, they can still leave a lasting legacy beyond themselves. For some, this day is marked by loneliness and grief as they spend this first Mother's Day as a widow, an orphan, or a parent who has lost a child. To those who today live in the wake of the death of a loved one, grant glimpses of the resurrection. Bring to them a steady resurrection of their broken hearts. Allow them to live into the future with hope and empower them to carry out the legacy of lessons instilled within them. For some, this is a day that surfaces ongoing tensions that exist within our personal relationships and family dynamics. We ask for healing from the wounds of our past, a path of forgiveness for wrongs both experienced and committed, and the rebuilding of trust forged in honesty, authenticity, and love. We give you thanks for the wide spectrum of motherhood represented among us today. New mothers and young mothers whose children are in their most tender years. Mothers of grown children who transition into empty nest and a new chapter of self-discovery. Mothers and grandmothers of advanced years whose twilight of life is marked by frailty of body, but a potency of spirit. There is a cumulative reminder that though our lives are marked by transition and change, your nature, nurture and affection for all your children remains the same. Therefore, remind us to live with a childlike faith, curious to every wondrous mystery, attentive to your every instruction, obedient to your every command, and willing to share with every one of your children. We give you thanks, O oh God, who is a loving mother and father of us all, and in whose name we pray, amen. Thank you. 
Today's reading are Isaiah 1, verse 11, and Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2 and 16. I am reading from the New International Version. Isaiah 11. The multitude of your sacrifices. What are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fat, fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. From Hebrews 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Our next hymn is There is a Balm in Gideon, and it's in the United Methodist hymnal number 375. It's my pleasure and, and a real privilege to welcome Eli Johnson as our guest speaker today. 
Eli is a lifelong activist and organizer and has held positions with the Guatemala Human Rights Commission, Public Citizens, Global Trade Watch, and the American Friends Service Committee, leading federal advocacy on immigration, trade, and US policy toward Latin America. Eli is a founding member of Sanctuary DMV and has trained thousands of people in the DC region and plan dozens of protests and other actions. And in June 2022, Eli was appointed the first executive director of Congregation Ac Action Network, a collective of more than 70 Christian, Jewish, Muslim, humanist, Hindu, Buddhist, and other congregations in the DC metro region, dedicated to demanding and upholding justice dignity, safety, and family unity for all immigrants and refugees in the region. So it is my pleasure to welcome Eli. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, Eli. Good morning. How are you all doing this Mother's Day morning? <laughs> busy, I see. I heard somebody comment on the weather. It's a beautiful day. Um, it's wonderful to see you all and wonderful to be here to get to celebrate this holiday with you. Um, thanks so much for that introduction. So again, I'm Eli Johnson, Executive Director of the Congregation Action Network. I'm also a queer, transgender organizer, advocate, and activist. So I'm going to talk to you all um, some about I'm not really actually going to talk to you about our work in this sermon. I'm going to talk to you, talk about that in the coffee hour. So I hope you all will join me. But I'm going to talk um, about a, a topic that's very close to my heart right now, which is um, trauma and the ways that trauma comes up in organizing and how organizing can actually also help us heal that trauma when, when it comes up. But I want to start by reading you all an excerpt that I really enjoyed from the Book of Re um, Resolutions of the United Methodist Church. So it says, the United Methodist Church believes God's love for the world is an active and an engaged love, a love seeking justice and liberty. We cannot just be observers. So we um, care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to call each of us into a response no matter how controversial or complex. I wasn't raised in the Methodist Church, but I was raised a lot with similar values, believing that part of a Christian life is a life seeking justice. And I've been an activist. Um, I've been somebody fighting for justice my entire adult life. Literally, even when I was in high school and was asked what I wanted to do when I grew up, I said I wanted to change the world. And I've been, on a, I've been an organizer on one issue or another for the last 20 years, um, and have been an advocate here in the DC area uh, just over a decade. Up until a few years ago, activism, activism was actually sort of all I did. Um, it was both my job and my social life, and even sort of how I chose where to live. So if I'm explaining to somebody, why did I choose this life? Why do I do this work? There are a lot of different ways that I can tell that story. So, for example, I can talk about stumbling on an anti-World Trade Organization protest in the spring of 1999 in Southern Oregon and getting really obsessed with the minutia of our, of our world trade system um, and begging my mother to please let me go to what would later be called the battle in Seattle. How many of you heard of that? Anybody remember 99, I see one uh, big protest that got pretty ugly in, um, in Seattle in 99. So I ended up missing the protest, but that, but stumbling on that and getting into that actually ended up uh, leading me to what I, what I did in college, both what I studied and what my activism was about, which was all about world trade. I can also, in talking about what led me to this life, talk about how I lived in Guatemala um, and I, how I organized alongside communities who were fighting for their lands and for their livelihoods. Uh, and I got really, really frustrated living there with the US policies that were driving people into poverty, into desperation, and to having to leave their homes. 
So I can, and how I came back to the United States to get a master's and be able to try to change those, those very policies. So I can talk about how I, how I wanted to use my position as a US citizen um, to advocate in the US to adopt policies that promoted human rights instead of human misery. Um, or I can talk about how before the end of 2016, I was working on several different issues, but after President Trump was elected, it felt nearly impossible to do anything except try to push back on his terrifying immigration policies. Often in telling my story about how I came to this work, I talk about the Lutheran intentional community that I lived in when I was 12, 13, 14, nestled way up in the North Cascades. Um, I talk about how there I got to know lifelong activists, people who had really dedicated their lives to gun control, to animal rights, to environmental, uh, environmental issues, and how I, through that, I sort of caught a glimpse of a potential future for myself. But what I don't often mention, at least until recently, was that I was abused by a member of that community, or that I grew up in a household affected by alcoholism and by mental illness. Up until recently, when I told my story, I told one of privilege and how I wanted to use that privilege. But I didn't tell the story of how the challenges that I faced, especially those in my early childhood, have really shaped my path and about how those challenges have reverberated and repeated throughout my life. So for example, when President Trump locked out and locked up nearly everyone seeking asylum in the United States, I got absolutely obsessed, often racking my brain, trying to figure out what I personally could do to make a difference. But I also felt completely paralyzed, frozen, um, when I tried to work on it, when I tried to write on it, when I tried to speak about it. And it would take me years to admit that that was because when I thought of asylum seekers trying to enter the United States and seek refuge here, I often thought of the many, many women that I had met in Guatemala and other parts of Central America who had suffered domestic violence or other kinds of gender-based violence. And the thought of them seeking refuge here and being met with torture, with detention, um, with being sent back to Mexico, um, not only horrified me, but it reminded me of my own experiences of domestic violence in, in Guatemala. And when I would try to sit down and write about what was going on in the US, my body was re-experiencing the terror of being dragged across a room by my partner and my um, extreme fear of going to the police there. But I couldn't, I didn't know that that's what my body was doing. I didn't know that that's why I was so frozen, both, both so obsessed with trying to do something and so frozen when I tried. I believe that these challenges that I've experienced offer as much of an explanation of why I do this work as the privilege that I have or my faith upbringing. But it's just been so much harder to face that and to acknowledge those forces in my life. Like so many other children of alcoholic children of alcoholics and addicts, I take responsibility for so much more than my fair share of what's going on in the world. Unable to control the alcoholics and addicts in my life, I, to I try to control other aspects of the world around me, like literally what the US Congress is doing, or more recently, what the DC Council or the Mon Montgomery Council is doing. Um, and in fact, when I was preparing this sermon, it was really hard for me to let go of how you all re will receive it and just to sort of focus on what I was trying to say. Similarly, one of the most pernicious effects of trauma in my life is the feeling that I'm never quite good enough or quite worthy of love. I often feel like I always need to be doing something, producing something, making the world better to make up for my many flaws. I have thoroughly internalized what author Alice Walker said, that activism is my rent for living on this planet. So my activism comes from a place of deep compassion, probably even deepened by the things that I have experienced, but it also comes from a place of insecurity. That doesn't necessarily make it bad, but if I'm not honest about that, it can make it very dangerous and potentially damaging. If my sense of self, of being good enough is tied up in my work for justice, then if someone criticizes me or how I'm doing it, that is an attack on me and my self-worth. 
I can get really defensive. Often, in fact, when we're defending ourselves from criticism or defending our values, our body responds as if we're under physical attack, as if we're being charged by a lion or almost hit by a bus. Um, our limbic systems that sends our body into fight, flight, freeze, appease mode doesn't necessarily know the difference between criticism or attack or sort of uh, an attack on our values or our privilege from an attack on our physical selves. So either way, I can go into that fight and flight mode um, with my either my sort of heart rate skyrocketing, palm sweating. I'm sure many of you have felt that. Um, or, or sort of going the other direction of you get into hypoarousal where your body just shuts down. But either way, I can't hear that feedback that somebody is giving me. So similarly, when I was trying to write an op-ed on the horrible conditions in detention for immigrants in the US, I would freeze. Because again, my body was responding to a memory of the past when I was physically attacked. Um, and so I, I couldn't actually get the thinking part of my brain online because that survival part of my brain was reacting. And when, the, when that survival brain kicks in, it stops the flow of information to your thinking brain. And I'll talk more about how all of this works, sort of the brain piece of it, and what we can do about this more again in the coffee hour. But so this, when my survival brain would kick into, the, into gear, it also made me sort of fearless in the face of physical danger. It's a superpower that I've actually used a lot over the years, either when I was accompanying communities in Guatemala um, or you know, doing, uh, having to spend days and days immersed in hearing sort of horrific testimony or protesting here in the United States. I could calmly stare down the barrel of a rifle trained on me or face off with police with batons and pepper spray, tear gas, um, with sort of preternatural calm. But until I started to actually heal my own trauma, things like writing an op-ed, I could get completely frozen um, and unable to move forward. So um, what does this have to do with our, uh, with our readings from today? So I think if we're not acknowledging the trauma, um, or the different ways that, that, that trauma and these past memories show up in our lives, um, we won't be able to hear messages from the Lord, like knock it off with the fatted animals and the blood of lambs, because it becomes so hard to take that, that feedback. Um, and if we can't, if we're not able to hear that sorts of feedback, how will I ever know if I'm serving justice and peace? Luckily, there's a lot we can do about this. There are many different kinds of tools and treatments out there for recovering from trauma. I've been on a healing journey for many, for many years and have made a lot of progress. I also truly believe that organizing and activism can help us heal from the past. We can actually rewrite memories of the past by facing off with things in the present that are bringing up those memories. And again, I'll, I'll speak more about that at the coffee hour. So if you notice the, the title of my message, uh, some of you might have been confused, what in the world does this have to do with buttering a cat? Uh, so if any of you spend much time on Twitter and either follow like disability justice advocates or union organizers, you might have come across cats named Jeans, Jean and George. Anybody, has anybody heard of them? See one nodding, not okay. Great, I'll tell the story. So, Jean and George live in an office, and it's never really clear what office they're in. Um, and Jean is described as a very intelligent tortoiseshell cat, and Orange is a giant, fluffy, long-haired, kind of clumsy, sort of lacking in um, problem-solving skills. And so, for example, while Jean can actually like open doors if they have knobs, uh, George can't figure out how to push a door open because he pushes it shut going the wrong direction every time he tries. Um, so, they, so if you go onto Twitter, look up Gene and Jorts, and you could read about this whole saga and how it started. Um, and at the beginning, we're introduced to one of Jean's and Jorts coworkers named Pam. Um, Pam gets really upset when accommodations are made for Jorts, uh, like cutouts in the door, so he doesn't keep locking himself in places when he nudges the door shut. Um, saying that George then doesn't have opportunities to learn and to get better. So it eventually comes out that Pam has been 
putting margarine on jorts to help him learn to clean himself better, which has led to some serious stomach trouble for the poor cat. And disability justice advocates have used Pam's actions as an example of people trying to make accommodations, uh, people who are uh, not disabled making accommodations for people who are disabled that they don't actually want and don't actually help. Um, and so they've used this term, are you helping or are you just buttering the cat? And I think this is what we can end up doing if we don't heal our own trauma and our own pain when we are stepping into work, into justice, work for justice. It's really important that we bring our whole selves into this work. The pieces that if we try to suppress different pieces of ourselves, they will show up in some way. But I'm, so I'm not saying we always need to center ourselves in our own healing, um, but healing and soothing ourselves will help us show up better in this work for justice. And by attend, like examining our own motivations and attending our own wounds, we can better position ourselves to know if we're truly working for justice or just trampling the courts of the Lord. So I actually want, uh, as an example of sort of the ways we're bringing this into our work for the rights and well-being of immigrants, I'm going to lead you all in a quick breathing exercise, if you'll bear with me. Because breath is so important uh, as a way to calm our nervous system down, nervous systems down after it's gone into that fight or flight. So please close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that, or if you're not, it's fine if you leave your eyes open. Slow your breathing so that it's about three counts in, one, two, three, hold for three, two, three, and then out for three, one, two, three. Keep breathing at about that rhythm. And as you do, pay close attention to what the center of your chest is doing. When you're breathing, does it rise and fall or does it stay in place? As you breathe in, can you feel your rib cage expanding around your lungs? Can you feel it going back down as you breathe out? As you breathe in, do your shoulders rise? They fall again as you breathe out? Or as you breathe in and out, are they still? One more breath out. One more breath in and out for me. So I will um, offer a few, a few more exercises at the coffee hour and talk again how we are incorporating this trauma healing into our work for justice. Um, again, we, the Congregation Action Network, organizes faith communities in DC, Maryland, and Virginia for the, to, to try to create a region where everyone can thrive, no matter where they were born or their immigration status. So please, come find out more and, and about how you can get involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eli, for that moving and inspiring message. And we, we look forward to hearing more at Coffee Hour. And of course, there'll be the delicious dishes laid on by the men to celebrate Mother's Day. We have been blessed in so many ways and received many good gifts from our God. And I now invite you to give thanks as you are able with your offerings as the ushers pass the plates. So please feel as you are able to give offerings.
Now please join me in the unison prayers printed in your bulletin. With what we give, O oh God, we demonstrate our deepest love, our gratitude and trust. Receive our gifts as offerings to you, commitments to your way of justice, mercy and humility. Amen. And now please remain standing for the closing hymn, Gift of Love, United Methodist Hymnal, number 408. Well, we are especially grateful to our visitors and thank them for coming and sharing in our worship and to Eli for the moving and inspiring message. And we invite everyone to join us in Fellowship Hall for coffee hour and to hear more about Eli's great work that, that being done in, this, in the district and in our region. And let us now, in this world of radical actions, let us commit ourselves to radical hospitality, to radical love and to constant hope that we may receive the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.